Your Partner in Success Radio is a free business podcast with host Denise Griffiths. It's all about great stories, conversation, and context to help you move your business and life forward with actionable tips and advice from her guest experts. To listen and subscribe, just find us on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you consume your podcasts. Good morning and welcome to your Partner in Success Radio. This is where top performers share their secrets to help you achieve your personal and your professional goals. I am your host, Denise Griffiths, and together with my genuinely amazing guests, we bring you inspiring and actionable insights to take your life and your business to the next level. Ranked in the top 2% globally, this podcast really is a must listen, again, because of my guests. So whether you're tuning in for entrepreneurial tips, career advice, or personal development strategies, get ready to turn inspiration to action, challenges into triumphs, and dreams into reality. Our topic today with my guest, Dr. Bridget Cooper, also known as Dr. B, is about becoming unflappable. I love that word. Bridget is a seasoned leadership expert, and I'm stressing that, seasoned leadership expert with a knack for making complex issues very approachable. So with over 30 years of experience, she combines her substantial credentials, including a doctorate in leadership, with a friendly, very relatable style. And her goal is to simplify tough problems and inject humor into difficult situations. She works with global companies to develop strategies, empower leaders, and alleviate conflicts while also coaching individuals to overcome mental barriers. We were talking about those in the virtual green room and unlock their potential. She has also authored seven books with Unflappable, How Smart People Quit Overthinking, Ditch the Trauma, and Thrive at Work. And that book is on my desk and it showcases her ability to transform complex ideas into practical solutions. And we're just about to dive into it and explore it further. Bridget, good morning. Welcome to your Partner in Success Radio. Good morning, Denise. Thank you so much for having me. And boy, can you be my front person for all of my introductions? Because you made me sound, I was like, who is she introducing? Oh, that's me. (laughs) (laughs) So thank you for that. That was very flattering and supportive. I appreciate it. It was easy to do. Trust me. I've read your book. You and I were chatting on Facebook last night back and forth. Yeah. I had... um, torn my office apart I don't why do we do these things Mm. I decided I needed a bigger monitor I didn't it was way too big so I had to pack it back up I'm going to have to send it back put my other one back up that was an all weekend thing so Mm. I made this monster mess and I had already read your book I have I do have a point I'm getting there I had already read your book because you sent this to me several months ago Mm -hmm. and I Thank you for doing that. So I'd read it. I always read it when it lands. I always read it the week of the podcast, but I also found it on Kindle Unlimited. So I've been reading it there as well. Mm-hmm. And I was, you know, we were chatting back and forth and I was taking pictures of it. It was we're having a good old time with it. It's a terrific book. And I, when I say I love the word unflappable, mm. no joke. I'm not joking at all. How did you come to, to how did you come up with that title? So I actually worked in collaboration with my publisher, uh, Summit Press Publishers. They're actually um, long friends of mine, and I've been doing independent publishing for the other six books. And I said, you know, I really want this book because I know it's my compendium. It's my collection of tools that I've been creating over the last couple of decades, two to three decades of working with people and helping them alleviate their problems, see them differently, and be able to solve them more swiftly and efficiently. And I wanted that body of work to be elevated in a way. And I knew that um, that Anne and, and Walt were the people to do that. So Anne and I got on a couple of different calls and we're doing our own like searching and, you know, finding words. And what was the word? What were the descriptions? How are people going to know that this is the book? And I'll have to throw the credit to her because I don't think it was me um, who came up with Unflappable. And we started searching for different things you know on the internet that said unflappable were people searching for unflappable because there's all these algorithms when you title a book and that was where we landed it just it just fit it just really fit for what we were talking about that there's so much that threatens our 
kind of steadiness and being unflappable is really where we all want to get to where we are steady in the storms that life brings us that we are able to you know either be seen as or be calm in every upsetting situation be able to see things more clearly so that we can address them in ways that serve us and the system and the and the company and you know our, our life story in ways that we have perhaps not done um, otherwise. And is this teachable? I can't tell you how many times <laughs> I've come across, across people who just the tiniest paper cut and they're swinging from the chandelier shrieking. And I, I'm not joking. That's not an exaggeration. Mm-hmm. I don't have patience with people like that. I don't suspect many people do. Mm-hmm. So can they learn to be a little less idiotic I mean (laughs) (laughs) when people stop inviting you for dinner there's a reason they don't like you right I you know I I have been um you know chastised especially by my my daughters who are very strong independent um you know, sometimes even judgmental, right? Uh, thinkers in their clarity around, you know, what what they will and won't tolerate in their lives. And then they have me who I'm always looking at people because I seek to understand them. I think, you know, depending on where you come from and what your life journey has been to this point, you develop different strategies to survive and then hopefully thrive from them. And one of mine was to seek to understand people and their complexities. And so I think that when you can understand what is motivating someone, what is behind the behavior that they are exhibiting, I think you can find a solution that you can present to them in a way that makes that change possible. But people are in charge of themselves. Uh, You know, people go from, you know, cradle to grave and express the same dysfunctional behavior, no matter how many times they've been invited. I mean, that's why we have the, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. That's where that came from because we've been for all of our humanity, trying to guide people to treat themselves and other people differently. And, and they can refuse no matter how many times you offer them the, you know, the solution. But, um, but I do think that when you can understand people better, you can offer more custom design solutions. And it's funny because one of my tools, one of my favorite tools, people always ask me, what are your favorite tools? I'm like, I can't pick them. It's like your children, you know, how can you pick? But I do have one that tends to rise above the rest and it touches on what you spoke about, which is, I don't know how many times you've had someone come to you and say, oh my goodness, you are not going to believe what so-and-so did, right? And my clients know better. Because when they come to me with that statement, they know my response. And my response is, oh, I absolutely can imagine what they did. I saw that coming. Why didn't you? Because if we're really paying attention to who people are, we can really see, we can anticipate their next move. And we create so many of our own dramas by fronting this shock. (laughs) <laughs> you know, this like, I can't believe this happened. When if you were paying attention, you could absolutely have won the lottery on the prediction that that was going to happen. And so I, I you know, my, one of the tools that I use to articulate and kind of encapsulate that is what I call compassion and accountability. This idea of this dual balance that we need to strike always in our lives with, with ourselves and with others of equal parts compassion and accountability. And what compassion basically says, it leads to this, is that every one of us is exactly who and where we are as a direct and predictable result of every experience we've had and every decision we've made. So it's not just what has happened to us but it is also all of the decisions that we have made about the things that have happened to us and the things that we have done, right? So it's, it's the decisions we've made coupled with the experiences that we've had and they bring us to this exact moment. And so compassion says, of course, compassion says, 
of course, this is who this person would be. Of course, this is what this person would do. This is how they would respond. This is who I am. This is what I look like. This is what I'm doing. Of course. And then you balance it with accountability, which is now what? So compassion says, of course, and accountability says, now what? Now, what am I going to do to make this situation different? What can I offer in terms of a tool? How can I approach this person differently? How can I see myself differently? How can I pursue something different so that my tomorrows line up in the way that I want them to if I'm not happy with where I am today, whether in relationship or, or in relationship with self? And that has been, that one tool has been so transformational for so many of my clients who, who all of them that use it because it's, it's, it makes so much clear, clearer and so that they don't get bogged down in that persistent questioning and, and upsetness over very clear experiences. You know, what I have noticed throughout my life is that as humans, we ask a lot of questions. We tend to be very, very curious, but we don't tend to drill down on the questions that we should be asking ourselves mm -hmm. on a daily basis. You know, Denise, why did you do that? What did it land you? What, are you? Do you want to do it again? I mean, I have constant conversations with myself, the cats and the cupboards. You know, I talk all the time. You wouldn't think I would, but I do. And I'm always asking myself, did that go wrong or did it really go wrong? Was mm. it just a, a glitch? What caused you to do that? And I have to sit with myself and dig. Mm. But without that curiosity, where are we? Yeah, and I, that's one of the other tools that I, uh, I teach to leaders that is so pivotal in their success. I, I think a lot of people have this mistaken notion that the more certain they are, the more confident and powerful they appear. When in fact, when you are curious, when you're walking into situations and you aren't sure what the right answer is, that you're wondering what it could be, what might be going on, and you're really looking versus jumping to conclusions and reaching certainty before you've done kind of an in-depth analysis as you do, uh, you know, talking with your cats and whatnot, <laughs> that you, you develop so much more clarity and more respect from others because you're getting to whatever conclusions you finally arrive at through a curious lens. And I think that we can all benefit from that as we look, because again, the more curious we are, the more we're able to take in more information, ask more informed questions and reach more clear and, uh, you know, based conclusions uh, instead of trying to jump to that mind. certainty. Right. And you have to change your mind on a regular basis. Like if I wandered around and just knew that I knew everything, I did this at 17. We all did. We're all sociopaths. <laughs> I'm surprised my mother let me live truly. <laughs> yeah. Until we're like 25 when that prefrontal cortex finally, I think, you know, settles in, then we have a chance. But yeah, boy, I, what's that quote? I wish I were as smart as my six-year-old thinks I am and half as, and twice you know, twice as smart, I have as smart as my six-year-old thinks I am and twice as smart as my 13-year-old thinks I am, you know? <laughs> That's exactly right. But if I stuck with all of the conclusions that I had drawn between, I don't know, birth and 17, oh, Lord. Right. <laughs> and well, and that- and, It would be ugly. It, and, and, and so many people, though, if you really dig in, though, and you know this, Denise, is that so many people- do think that way, right? And it's, and I understand it again, so much compassion for it because, you know, when we look at the brain and that's the other thing that I do in Unflappable is I really respect the, our, our, our biology, right? How we got to this point, because unless you respect how we got here, you're not going to find the answers to how we get out. And when you look at the brain and its formation, you know, we're born with no neural connections. We have all these cells, we have all this this potential, this raw potential, but we don't have any way of understanding our world and our place in it at birth. It forms after that. So all of our 
experiences, particularly before the age of eight and then in our teen years, is when the substance called the myelin, um, myelin, so there's this myelin sheath, it's basically like the superconductor for neural connections, it's like putting, if you ever did this in, in college, um, putting, uh, you know, Vaseline on the back of a, a dining tray and you go flying down the, the snow covered hill. It's that same kind of uh, sheath that goes around these neural connections that m helps us to make those very quickly and efficiently, which means that we don't do a lot of consideration as to whether or not it's the right thing to do. It's not a smart idea to put Vaseline on the back of a dining <laughs> right? But, you know, you see TNT. Now you tell me. Right? <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, doing it with great fervor. Uh, sorry for that idea, teens. Um, but... So we have this, this in abundance, this myelin in abundance before the age of eight and in our teen years, and we know our teen years are not times when we should be making decisions and reaching conclusions quickly, but we do it anyway. So our brains are formed in this way. And so we make sense of ourselves in the world around us based in these millions of connections that we've made that are often unconscious. You know, we're just kind of moving through our world, reaching conclusions, having thoughts without consideration, and therefore feeling things that relate and directly uh, are correlated to those thoughts. And then we see limited behavior options as a result. So all of us are just kind of walking around on this autopilot when we might need to go back and reconsider how some of those conclusions were reached because we might not have been getting the best inputs to be able to deliver the best outputs. And I, I approach those, those decisions and those perceptions as we have them in a lot less complicated vernacular. And I, talk, I call them contracts. The, these contracts that we sign before we have the agency to be able to do that in our early life. And we sign these contracts which articulate how we think of ourselves and other people and how we believe our, our place in the world is earned and, you know, what loyalty means and what success means and all of these things, all of these concepts. But we signed them when we had no business signing anything. We made these decisions. We built these neural connections when we really might not have signed them or, or, or made them in the way that we did if we had the power of reflection that we now have. And so I, I talk about these contracts as being things we can now rewrite we can now create new neural connections. We can now create new decisions and, and perceptions about our world and our place in it because we have new information that can really, it disputes that early information that we were, we were given. And so in challenging ourselves to look at those experiences differently and seeing what other information we might have concluded from that same experience, we can write new contracts and therefore have new experiences in our world and uh it's yeah so there's a whole guidebook on that and unflappable as well and in pain rebel which is the book that came out prior i know and last night when i was really i was laying on my couch with my kindle reading your book and talking to my cat because he was on my bladder and i wanted to I had this visual of you, Denise, when you said that, and I was like, how does she not drop the Kindle on her face? Because every time I do that in like a a laying position, I drop either the book or the uh, yeah uh, iPad on my face. So good for you. Yep. Um, no, I do it when I'm about to go to sleep. I'll fall asleep briefly. And go, Ow. <laughs> so uh -huh. But yeah. my, what I was thinking because I was tired and I was cranky because I'd spent two days moving mm. monitors around, but I got it all done. So that was a woohoo. But while I was reading and I can't remember what chapter it was, I remember thinking that I needed to ask you, and we just touched on it briefly. When we're kids, we're operating on feelings. Mm. And then, you know, when we've signed these contracts, which is brilliant, I think we're still operating on feelings, but I think, and I wanted to get your, your thoughts on this. I think that operating on feelings by and large really hampers your ability to, to, uh, you know, get into your critical thinking skills mm -hmm. that can cause no lack of trouble. If you, if you don't get there. Right. Well, I think that to understand how we operate on feeling, we have to understand again, how the brain works. So in study after study, what they've shown is that thoughts precede feelings and feelings precede behavior. 
And you can return back, you can complete that loop over and over again, but there are thoughts that are behind our feelings. So if we are feeling something, we have made an assumption or we've made reached a conclusion, we thought something about something in order to get that feeling to get sent into our bloodstream. Like the feelings come from biochemical reactions that are created from thoughts. Now, oftentimes those thoughts are unconscious, they're automatic because we create what what behaviors call a mental model, like a it's it's you know a framework for understanding ourselves in the world. And those mental models create those automatic thoughts that come from something. So, you know, if you have, if you're driving in traffic and someone cuts you off and your natural affinity toward the world is that, you know what, you know, go in peace, right? You must be needing something. Maybe you have a relative who's struggling. Maybe you're racing off to drop a kid at daycare and, you know, you're going to be late to work and you've got a really angry boss and, you know, whatever. And you just let that person just cut you off. And you're like, oh, you know, be safe out there, friend. You know, I, I hope you make it to, to your job. If that's your orientation toward the world, And that's the automatic thought or series of statements that you make to yourself. Imagine what feelings you're going to have. Feelings of peace, feelings of gratitude that you're safe, feelings of gratitude that you're not racing off, that you don't have a sick family member, you know, what have you. Feeling of calm. On the other hand, if you have a mental model that everyone's always trying to take something from you, that when people are given the opportunity, they do bad things. If your orientation is that, you know, that it, it's a life is unfair and that people are inconsiderate, right? These are all the statements that you make as you go through your world and someone cuts you off in traffic. The feeling that you have that responds to those thoughts is going to be very different than the first example, right? And that's going to lead you to honk your horn and, you know, maybe try to cut them back off when you reach them ahead in traffic. And that shows that it's not about the feeling that we're having. It's about the feeling is consistent with the thought and the thoughts are are consistent with the mental model that we have about ourselves in the world, which is why the secret sauce is in those contracts. Because when we rewrite those contracts, we can approach so many things in our lives so differently to have different feelings that are more consistent with the life experience we're looking to have, unless we want to be miserable and by God, go right ahead. That is, that is, we all have the license to make that choice. And we all know people who have made that choice over and over again in their lives, but it doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't. And listen, when I was a kid, when I was younger, I was chronically late, which I came to understand was very rude very Mm -hmm. rude and you know I just don't do it anymore but I was always late I was always you know trying to get somewhere I was always in a rush I was always running into people on the road who were just like me obnoxious they were (laughs) you know it was like why am I attracting these people and this was years ago I'll never forget it but you know I was trying to figure my way through a four-way stop and you know doing all the weird things that we do when we're in the car that we shouldn't be doing. Turn off the radio, put your phone down, do all, just stop, pay attention to what's going on. I wasn't. And this guy, you know, he gets past me and he flips me off and I went, and I blew him a kiss. Yeah. (laughs) It It was instant. I just decided I'm not going to deal with this anymore I'm the root cause of it and I just knew that Mm -hmm. and I blew him a kiss and he stopped (laughs) he kind of slowed down he looked at me started laughing I went there you go have a nice day now I leave 15 minutes early no matter if I'm going to the grocery store which I've been to a hundred times in the last year Mm -hmm. because I still get lost I have no sense of direction and I live in the deep south they keep moving my signposts (laughs) A trailer there. There was a horse trailer. What the heck? So I get lost. So, you know, I know this. I know that I'm going to get lost. I'm going to have to turn around. I'm not going to be late. And I, I structure accordingly. Right. Or I blow you a kiss. I'm an irredeem, irredeemable smart ass. I know this. So yeah. I might as well have fun with it. Right. Yeah, you've shown that behavior changes 
can create so much of a cascading, you know, experience in your mind. And you said something that I just wanted to point out because a lot of people talk about the law of attraction and there's lots of different schools of thought on this, but I just, again, want to pause us for a moment and talk about brain science as it relates to the law of attraction and what we pull into our lives energetically. And again, I have lots of thoughts on this, but I just want to go brain science at this point. There's this part of our brain, it's in the brain stem, you know, the earliest kind of space in our brain that it, it operates a lot of different things in our experience. It's called the reticular activating system. But one of its jobs is to seek what you have put into it to seek. So it's a survival mechanism. So, you know, I need food everywhere. You're now like this radar detector for finding food. Where can I forage food from, you know, from our earliest ancestors? how we use it now, how it comes up now, you'll appreciate this. If you are looking for, you are thinking that the world is full of jerks. Do you know what you're going to find? Jerks and bad drivers. Right. Exactly. Same thing. You know, this happens if you are, you're in the market for a new car. I remember when I was shopping for my Jeep, I was like, oh, I love Jeeps. I love, I, I just love them. The, the Jeep Wranglers are so cute. Denise, I was like, does anyone drive anything other than Jeeps? Because that's all I see now on the road. I see Jeeps everywhere. That was my reticular activating system, seeking the thing that I put into its brain, into its, its cells to seek for me. So that reticular activating system helps us to find the thing that we are focused on, which is why gratitude practices work. It's not just because like, oh, you know, I'm just feeling so grateful, even though my life is in the, you know, the, the crapper and, you know, this is, I'm just, I'm going to talk myself out of this with toxic positivity. No, it's because when we put into our heads, I am grateful for, and I need to find things to put in my journal tonight that I am grateful for. We've stuck into our reticular activating system an agenda item to go find things that we are grateful for. And therefore we find them. So we can that's so that. true. I do this all the time. Yeah. That's absolutely true. Okay, keep going. <laughs> it's magical, right? So if we can appreciate that we are at a cellular level, a series of interactions in our in our makeup, we can use that knowledge to be able to change some of the things that aren't working for us and put good things in. Because if you put bad things in, you get bad things on the other side. You put good things in, you don't always get great things. I mean, I've messed up enough things in the kitchen to, to prove that point. I can put all sorts of great ingredients in. And if I mix the wrong things together at the wrong temperature for the wrong time, I'm going to end up with junk on the other side. But I have a greater likelihood of doing that if I put good ingredients in. If I put rotten food, I'm going to get rotten food, right? And so when we put better inputs in, we have a greater likelihood of getting better outputs out. And I and I say that because a lot of people when they when they read my books, when they coach with me, when they do, you know, they come to a seminar or, you know, leadership series that they do they have me in as a consultant on their leadership team, any of those spaces, they often are looking for me to bring a magic wand in to magically change other people and therefore make their lives better. Now, I can give them so many approaches to receive what they're receiving from other people differently, looking at those experiences differently, approaching those people differently, but I cannot change those other people. What I find is that when people are focused on trying to change the people outside of themselves, the situations that are away from themselves, instead of looking inward, they feel much greater leagues of failure. And so you I want people to- Every look. bad marriage that you've ever heard about. Right. You know, they're always looking. I, I remember one of my favorite quotes from Sex and the City Carrie goes into a therapist and she starts talking about her love life and all these failed relationships. And the therapist looks at Carrie and says, do you know what all these men have in common? And Carrie's like, you, <laughs> you, right. like, you. I've never seen the show, but I could see that coming. <laughs> And you're the common denominator because Carrie was thinking like, what? They're narcissists. They're this. Well, yeah, they could have all those bad things. And it's not to say that other people don't behave in detrimental and dysfunctional ways and aren't, 
you know, sometimes pure evil, like, right, it, it happens. There are people and there are situations that are bad. But the only thing that we have control over is us. Now we can influence other people to a far greater degree, the more in control of ourselves that we are. And that means looking, taking deep inventory of those contracts, looking at the thoughts that we are having, taking responsibility for them, blowing kisses in traffic instead of flipping people back off, you know, doing those things, creating a, 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 an experience of our feelings that is understanding and compassionate and welcoming of them and not necessarily trying to talk ourselves out of the feelings that we're having, but examining why we are having them in the first place and being able to make conscious, deliberate effort toward fixing those things. And that's what unflappable requires. You know, when I, we came up with the the tagline for, you know, the subtitle of, you know, quit overthinking, ditch the drama and thrive at work. It was about, it, it really does show you that it's starting with us on the inside. The work is on the inside in order to help change our outsides. And that's where, that's where the secret sauce is, is built. And how many times do we, we hear ourselves, I've said it myself, or we'll he'll hear somebody say, well, if I could just get him or her to just stop, yeah. Just, yeah. <laughs> listen to yourself, stop talking. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and, it, crazy. and I get it. And, and, you know, we do, I think if we come from a place of benevolence and we want the best for other people, which I hope is where more of our energy is coming from than just trying to fix the, the irritation in our lives, then we appreciate that a couple of things. One, the more that we do the work on the inside of us, the more that we have bandwidth to deal with the nonsense that other people bring us. You know, I was a single parent and I can tell you that when I wasn't getting enough rest, when I wasn't eating the right foods, when I wasn't exercising properly, when I wasn't giving myself the grace and the compassion that I required for the journey that I was on, I was far shorter tempered with my children. I was far less available to them and their needs when they required something so it really does begin with us. If we are going to deal with the nonsense that people are serving us in our lives, we have to figure out how to build our own internal resource center to build, you know, fill our own tanks. And then we have the capacity to be able to guide others to follow in our leadership, right? So if I, if I have a leader who is disheveled and, you know, um, reactionary and, uh, you know, not having high emotional, you know, IQ, I'm very unlikely to follow their lead in doing what it is that they're doing and the practices that they're having, because I'm saying, well, where did that get you? Look at what you're doing. But if they are showing me that they are calm, that they are curious, that they have they come to situations giving themselves compassion and accountability and doing that with others. I'm going to look at that person and say, you know what? I want what they have. I want to get me some of that. And that's how we get other people to make changes is by showing them the way that we make our own by leading by example, by putting that, you know, that example forward. And so, yeah, we can't make the decision for other people, but we can make it so much more inviting and, and, and allow our influence to lead them to the changes that we hope they make. Exactly. And this is going to sound strange for somebody with a podcast, but I very rarely listen to people, although I'm listening to you right now, <laughs> I'm going to make the exception being my podcast. But I'll hear people say something and it's like, yeah, it's like, but look at you. I'm instantly right. judgmental because their words are not matching up with what I know I have watched them do. Mm -hmm. Big yeah. difference. Watch they're what not, people are yeah. doing. Yeah, they're not living in integrity, right? right. They are, you know, and I, I think that in our soundbite culture, in our social media, there's such a drive to appear in ways that are not always in concert with how we are feeling and what we're doing. And I, 
I think that my gift with Unflappable is to give people the toolkit to be able to live in integrity, to be able to lead in integrity, to operate so that their insides and their outsides match. You know, there's that quote of never judging your insides to someone else's outsides because what you see is not always what you get. And I think that we have the opportunity every day to become a better version of ourselves. And by using the tools that so many of us are giving, you know, like whether it's unflappable or, you know, pick your favorite book. I know you've got, you know, thousands of them of things, people, things that people are saying, the tools that they have created over the years of experience that can help us to be better versions of ourselves so that we can be in integrity. I have to tell you, I've got uh, chapter three bookmarked over here. I've got sticky notes all over this thing. It got fat over time, but it's called <laughs> Interpersonal Toolkit. And I'm going to read the first paragraph because I just cracked up. You know, I did. Self-improvement is hard work with a collection of stress-busting techniques in your arsenal. It's time to turn your focus, focus further inward. Other people can be such a pain in the ass. I lost it. I went, really? <laughs> Other people. The biggest pain in the ass I know is me. What are you talking about? Yeah. <laughs> but I recognize this about myself. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So, we are, right? We're the we're yes. the, our own worst enemies so often. And you know, that's it's funny because when we were I was putting together the book, you know, we were having these discussions, you know, at the publishing house and saying, you know, people need to see we often jump to seeing the other person as the problem. So I had to invite people in to show them, yes, I do have tools to make other people's nonsense less. But the secret is when you open the book, oh, right, I'm going to make other people's BS less impactful because I'm going to be steadier to deal with it. Like I'm going to be the calm in their storm because I'm the calm in my own storm more. And that's really where I try to, I, you know, I bring people to and the work that I do is recognizing that, that story that we keep telling ourselves, the way that we keep narrating our lives and our experiences in putting the power outside of ourselves to make our lives different. Like if we are going around and saying, if only that person would do this, if only this person would do this, where is our power? Exactly. And, you know, I, we're coming up on wedding stuff come in June, you know, pretty soon we're wedding everything. I'm not much for marriage. Anybody who knows me knows I've been married. I'm never doing it again. Thank you very much. It's not good for me. It's not good for anybody around me. I'm an introvert. Don't talk to me. Leave me alone. But I always hear, and this pops up around this time of year, people are planning and they're getting ready. Oh, I just, I can't wait to be happy forever. For, what? <laughs> what's wrong with you? What's wrong with, what's wrong with right now? I get very head up. I mean, it's, you know, it's a sudden thing. I'm all head up. I listen to these people. I watch and say, what are you thinking? It's not going to automatically fix everything that's going on with you right now. Stop it. Wow. I get pretty hysterical about it. Yeah, it's like this magical thinking. Yeah. That happens that some thing outside of ourselves is going exactly. to do something inside of ourselves, you right. know, right. and we really need to, to look inward if we're going to have better outward experiences, you know, to, to own the, our own story, to, to take ownership over our own histories. Uh, you know, I was just talking with a client this morning about, they were getting really reactive about, you know, some things that were going on in their lives. And I said, you know, of course you would, because if you look at the history that brought you to this point, that is where, that's how you would respond to this. Of course you would. Now, in order to do that differently, we need to have you follow different practices. You need to do, we talk about doing the work. Like, what does that mean, Dr. B, to do the work? I'll pick up a copy of Unflappable. That'll be your start. But it's it's going inside and saying, how have I been creating my own misery? And it doesn't have to be. And that's one of the things I I I, I love about 
how I put Unflappable together. I don't know if you know this about my history, but five years ago, I was in a motor vehicle accident. I was a passenger in a car going through an intersection and somebody came through the intersection the other direction, paid no attention to the red light and slammed into my side of the car and flipped us and sent us up the, up the road on, on the roof. And so in that process, I suffered a traumatic brain injury and I, you know, lost 25 IQ points. You know, I have um, visual and auditory processing disorder. I, you know, I'm nauseous from the moment I wake up in the morning to the moment I go to bed at night. Basically, I'm, I'm like, I've got a hangover, you know, 24 seven without the fun of the alcohol. And so my, one of the limitations that I now have is that my attention span and my ability to focus and endure things for a long period of time and to sequence, to be able to take something from step one to step 25 is so much harder. You know, I'm like a, I'm like a, a duck on a pond where you just see the ducks, you know, floating, but underneath they are paddling, you know, but they're alive. And so when I wrote Unflappable, I did it through that challenge. So I knew that the only way that I could complete the project would be to do it in small bite-sized chunks. And so the, the reader then benefits from my disability because I give it to you in these little two or three page snippets, like here, here's the thing that can help you today. Oop, we're going on to the next one. Here's the thing that can help you today. Go on to the next one. And so it, it really does serve so many of us who have short attention spans, who want something really easy and quick and direct and, and, and easy to apply because I had to do it that way in order to do it through my own experience, you know, like be able to, to live through this writing with my limitations um, as they are. You know, I remember during our pre-interview some months ago, because it took us quite a while, you know, I'm booked so far out that it took quite a while for our schedules to mesh and to get you here. Yeah. But I remember you telling me about, you know, your, your injury and the accident and that you lost 25 IQ points and you're going to laugh at me, but I remember, and I don't think I said it out loud. Um, man, if she lost 25 IQ points, she must've been terrifying before this. <laughs> so it's like, you are one of the smartest, most articulate people I've ever come across, but I'm not afraid of you anymore. So <laughs> you know, it's funny you say that because I, you know, I think so our, again, you know, I say this quote a lot, you know, judging our, our insides to other people's outsides, my experience of myself and, and people who have known me for many years, they notice the difference. And so there's four parts of intelligence when they do these IQ tests, there's processing speed, there's recall, there's uh, analytical ability and verbal acuity, right? So yes, what you're noticing is that my analytical ability and my verbal acuity are are up there, right? Like they are gifts that I, I was given. And so I, I have them. Where I lost the points, where the part of my brain that, that was damaged in the accident are in my processing speed and my recall. So I am much slower to interpret and to make sense of things than I used to be. So what I used to just be on hyperspeed all the time, like, you know, my, my, uh, my best friend calls me the energizer bunny to, yeah, as a joke, but also for that's how I, I lived my life. I was always running, jumping, juggling, grabbing, doing, and that dropped. So the inconsistency between those two parts of how my brain operates is where the, the, the deficit shows up. So I work very, very hard and have for the last five years in trying to, one, accommodate for it, right? Like in the, the time that I spend working and, you know, the, the cadence with which I do it, but also techniques that I've learned through multiple different therapies to figure out how to increase my recall, to be better at following along and processing things and how I go about solving problems so that I can appear to the outside to be better. And not because I want to trick anybody, but because I don't want 
the accident and the deficits that it's left me with to rob me of the ability and the intention and passion that I have to leave behind in as many moments as I'm given the best parts of me. And so I'm, I'm just, I'm dedicated to that experience. So yeah, so I am that duck floating on that pond. I love that, that analogy. What are some of the things that you're doing to help yourself? Do you mind sharing? Oh, no, not at all. So I think one of the biggest things is that I, um, and it's a gift. I think I, I I heard one of your other guests, one of the podcasts that um, Inarini, if I'm mispronouncing his name, I apologize. Yeah. Anthony Inarino. Yeah, Inarino. And um, he, uh, see, I, my recall is okay if I if I try. Um, I, I got pretty close. But one of the things that he said, and and you guys were talking about as well, is that some of the the biggest gifts that I have received have been from the hardest moments. And so I am incredibly grateful for the brain injury because it gave me so many gifts I wouldn't have, I think, collected had I not had that. And one of those things is my ability to be present is even stronger than it ever was. And it used to be one of my superpowers, but it is absolutely one that I curate and cultivate all the time because I have to be in this moment. Like I'm not skipping ahead or jumping back because that would require that that would it, it, what it would show up as is that my processing speed would drop <laughs> because I can only I can only process one thing at a time so I am in the moment that I'm in with you uh and I didn't do that all the time very well in the past and I still slip up I mean I'm not there 100 percent of the time but I know that my disability requires that I do that so I'm very focused on being in one thing at a time and allowing myself the pauses and the downtime that I require, you know, like in the past, I do a lot of keynotes and, and workshops. I used to show up at these events and work the room and, you know, and, and network and do all these things. And after the accident, I recognized, yeah, I can do that a little, but it's going like my, I only have so many, somebody gave me this um, analogy. You're given a number of spoons and you only have so many spoons to use in a day. And if you use all your spoons in this place, you don't have any spoons left for these other things. So I have, how I approach my life is being very stingy with my spoons. You know, I don't do things that don't allow me to then recuperate and recover in ways that I can deliver better things. So I don't give my time away in the ways I might've done before, if it's not going to have an ROI, not necessarily a financial one at all, but an ROI of giving the best parts of me. So I'm very, I, I give myself breaks. I give myself downtime. I, I show myself that level of self-care I spend the first part of my morning every day doing a lot of brain activities where I'm trying to remember things. I'm trying to process things. I'm trying to, you know, um, exhibit some of those behaviors. So I'm retraining using that neuroplasticity model of trying to create the experience of my brain that I want versus the one that I was delivered to me. I've read a lot about that particular model. And when you said stingy, I immediately wrote no strategic. Yes. <laughs> Strategically stingy then. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. It's like, you're not being stingy at all. You're taking care of yourself and by extension, helping other people. Right. Because I want to be able to give the best version of myself to the people who are in my life, whether they be clients, friends, or family. And in order to do that, I cannot squander that. So I'm, I'm giving my attention now in a fire hose versus a sprinkler. And I used to be able to get away with the sprinkler model because I had enough water coming into that sprinkler that it was doing its job, but I just don't now. So I need to be able to focus my attention much more clearly. And, and with that, I'm able to give in the same way that people had me had experienced me in the past, but just differently. 
Well, that makes perfect sense. And thank you for sharing that story. I know it's, you know, I can kind of feel people going, ow, oh, ow. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. The further you listen, you're like, oh, okay, well, it's not, you know, as bad as it could have been. She's working on it. She's teaching me how to work on things. Thank you. Yeah, I think, you know, sometimes we see these negative things in our lives. And I think we we do one of two things often, which isn't helpful, is either we deny their impact, right? We don't grieve, because I do, I still grieve the accident. I still grieve the parts of myself that are no longer as strong as they were before, you know, the parts of myself that are more limited, the things that I you know, I, 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 I sometimes I'm like, I'm a, I'm a 90 year old woman you know, and I'm only in my fifties, you know, but I, I do grieve those pieces. We have to, we have to look at those ugly parts, but we also have to lean into the opportunities that we're given. I have so much more compassion for people who have, you know, chronic illness and because in chronic pain, because I now live in that world and I, I, I saw it, I, I felt, I thought I was doing a good job when I was listening to people who had those struggles. But I can tell you, Denise, that I I have so much more because I have firsthand experience with it. So I think there's this idea that we try to hide some of those struggles from other people. And in doing so, we rob other people of being able to see themselves in your struggle. You know, I mean, for people who are listening to this, who have a struggle of their own, they're like, wait a minute. So, okay, she might understand me in a way that other people maybe haven't. But if I didn't share that story, they wouldn't have seen that. That's exactly right. And I actually did have it on my my very short list of things to ask you about, because when I bring guests on, I've already read your books. I know who you are. We've chatted I don't want to get in your way by asking a bunch of, you know, answer this question. Let's move on. I just, I can't do it, (laughs) but I love to hear stories. And that was a very personal story. And thank you so much. And I wanted to ask you, Bridget, because we've got about 10 more minutes. So I'm back in the book. I love this book on page 125. And the chapter is professional avatar. And basically, I love this chapter, I'm telling you, and it says to effectively navigate our day-to-day work life, we need to clearly define our core characteristics. And I'm going to tell y'all, I am a solopreneur. You do not want me in your office. I don't play well with others. I run with scissors. And if you want coffee, you can get it your own damn self. I have to work alone. So that being said, this is still my work life. This yeah. is where I, This is where I work. Yeah. And I work with the leaders, um, you know, that are in my my coaching and consulting practice on this activity with uh, in an unrelenting way, because I believe that a lot of leaders are they have the struggles that they have because they're trying to be all things to all people in the way that doesn't necessarily showcase their gifts. You know, we've had, just if you look at like on a political landscape, if you look at it without having any, paying any attention to what we're, um, you know, like what your political affiliation is, if you simply look at the progression of leaders and how there's this one leader does one thing very well and they carry us through in this way, but they have these deficits and then the next leader comes in and picks up those pieces, but doesn't do necessarily what that last leader did very well. You know, sometimes we just try to be the perfect leader. Well, the perfect leader is the person who is being the best version of themselves, who is giving their gifts to people. And it's very clear in that mission and identity. And the professional avatar exercise is the way to do that is to say, these are my core values and these are the ways that I express those values. And this is how I show up in every meeting, every conversation, every project, using that guiding principle, that set of characteristics to deliver on those promises instead of trying to be a person that they aren't. 
And that's how they use their energy to the best of their ability to be the success, most successful versions of themselves. And I have countless stories of clients who, when they figured that out, everything changed. They were more successful. They were better received. They were happier in their work life. They were doing things that they, they, that brought value to conversations. They were not squandering their gifts by being able to be very clear and intentional in who they were being in those situations. I pushed the wrong button. I had muted you in the book. In, in this conversation, Bridget, you've talked a lot about compassion. Mm. And compassion, I think, is something that people may not genuinely understand why we need it. We need right. to be compassionate with ourselves. We need to be compassionate with other people. Yeah. And, and I don't mean bleeding heart. Oh, you poor thing. You know, here's my my last dollar. I don't mean that. That's pity. I mean, yeah. Exactly. That's exactly right. And I don't think it's always helpful, but depends on the situation. Sure. But it, it really, we tolerate so much that we should not tolerate. Mm. In our lives. And I'm constantly ask, asking myself, what am I tolerating today? And if I catch myself being really cranky about something and I'm not being compassionate to myself, sit down, Denise, we're going to have a talk. Yeah. Well, I, I, I think what you just did, and I do this in a lot of the talks that I do, and if anybody um, you know, wants to find out where I'm speaking next, they can reach out to me. But I talk, I, what I'll do is I'll, somebody will present something as, as a, you've just described a struggle that you're having, and I'll flip to the back of the book, <laughs> to the back of Unflappable, I'll go to the index, which I love that my, my publishers agreed with me that this had to be in the book. And I'll go back and I'll find, okay, which tool is going to help them with that? And the one that pops up top of mind for what you talked about just now is nice versus kind. So many times we think of ourselves in situations, we behave in ways that we think are nice. I'm being agreeable. I'm being helpful. And I put that in air quotes. I'm I'm doing this thing because I want to be seen as nice. The problem is, is that so often it is not kind. We are not being kind to other people because we are enabling bad behavior. We are reinforcing um, their helplessness. We are not being true and honest with them. And then we are creating in ourselves resentments and frustrations that are going underground. You know, when we are nice, we are actually building walls between ourselves and other people and not allowing the truth to be the guiding principle, right? So we are being nice and not kind. And I, the people who I, you know, the people I coach and, and have spoken to, when I say that sometimes it's a gut punch because they recognize that mirror that I've just held up to them of, oh, right, I've put this value on being nice and I have been unkind to other people, and now I don't like them. Richard, you know? lazy. It's a lazy way to behave. Yeah. You're not taking any role in trying to help anybody, them or yourself, to understand. You're just saying, okay, thank you. Have a nice day. We do that in yeah. Seth. If we say in the South, you have a nice day now, that means <laughs> go to another zip code now. <laughs> yeah. You know, there's yeah. a lot of ways of being nice. And I don't think they're always all that great, to be honest. No. And I have so much, again, compassion for why we do it, like what the origin of that is. You know, the, they say the path to hell is paved with good intentions, right? So the intentions can be good. But when the delivery is off, the result is off. And that's the challenge that we have in front of us to ch make better choices so that the outcomes are better. Now I'm just realizing why nobody ever says, Denise, you're so nice. Because <laughs> 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 Because because you're kind, Denise, because you are kind, you already knew the lesson that I taught there. So good on you. Well, thank you. I feel better. I was about to go beat myself up underneath the trees. It's nope. just like, please, calm yourself. 
no sense in that. No sense in that at all. Well, listen, we are now running out of time and I hate that, but where can people find you? I really appreciate your company and I love your book. I know I've said it to our audience, get this book. It needs to become part of your entrepreneurial library. Mm -hmm. So um, tell people where they can find you. And if you have any last minute, any last minutes, last thoughts to share, tell us that too. Absolutely. So thank you, uh, Denise, for inviting me on, on this podcast because you are at the consummate host. And I really have appreciated the time that we've spent together both on and off air. So yeah, people can reach out to me. I think the easiest way is at drbridgetcooper.com. I'm sure it'll be in your show notes and they can click on a link directly from there to pick up their own copy of Unflappable, or they can head on over to Amazon and do the same. I do have an ask that if you have read it, if you are reading it, you do read it, that you do this author a huge favor and actually other people a favor by doing a review of the book. Because when you review a book on Amazon, the more reviews that an author gets, the more that Amazon throws into their algorithm that people are enjoying the read and then will market that book to other people. So you're helping to increase its reach. So if you've appreciated what Unflappable has done for you, you're giving a gift to other people by helping them find Unflappable through no direct effort of my own, right? There's only so many ways that I can reach people. Uh, so yeah, you can also reach me again directly through my website at drbridgetcooper.com. Find me on social media the same way. And I would love to hear from you if you have a, a desire for a speaker that could give some of this information to your audience. I am there for it. If you're looking for a coach to accompany you on this journey, I would love to be your partner in that. If you're looking for a consultant to help you build a better team, build a better leadership uh, platform, I can be that person to you as well. So I would, I would welcome the opportunity to give my gifts to you in the way that I have them. And uh, I guess the last bit of uh, the last piece I will leave you with is that is my mantra that I say all the time. And my students, when I was teaching at the graduate level, you know, would parrot it back to me with, with a uh, wild uh, abandon that awareness equals choice and choice equals power that the more aware we are of what is going on inside of us and between ourselves and other people, the more choices we have in front of us and the more choices that we have in the ways that we respond, both in our, in our thoughts, in our feelings, and in our behaviors, the more power we have. And I do mean power from within, not power over other people. It increases our ability to exercise that power in responsible and respectful ways and to be able to then influence other people in the best possible way and to really do what all of us, I think, when we look inside of ourselves and do a self-inventory, we want to leave the best parts of ourselves behind for others in every interaction. And we can do that better the more aware that we are. So with that, I, you know, I, I offer any one of my books, but Unflappable is, of course, my my favorite for this purpose because it gives you the tools to be able to be more aware. You know, I'm almost speechless. That mantra was just beautiful, and thank you. Thank you. Well, listen, everybody, as we conclude today's episode, your feedback means a lot to me. And if you found the show helpful, please support us with a quick review on iTunes. Your input is it's really vital in my mission to inspire and empower more individuals. So don't forget to hit subscribe, leave a review, and share your partner in Success Radio with friends. And be sure to go find Dr. Bridget Cooper on the web, read this book, leave her, her review, and connect with her in any way you can. She's brilliant. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in, and I will see you next week. Bridget, again, thank you. Thank you. Get your voice heard. If you would like to launch your own far-reaching podcast, contact Denise Griffiths at yourofficeontheweb.com and go to the podcast tab.